Part One of the Astral Plane by Charles Webster Ledbetter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. The Astral Plane: Its Scenery, Inhabitants, and Phenomena by C. W. Ledbetter, London, Theosophical Publishing Society, Seven Duke Street, Adelphi, W. C. Benares, Theosophical Publishing Society. Madras, The Theosophist, Office, Adyar, 1895. Preface Few words are needed in sending this little book out into the world. It is the fifth of a series of manuals designed to meet the public demand for a simple exposition of theosophical teachings some have complained that our literature is at once too abstruse too technical and too expensive for the ordinary reader and it is our hope that the present series may succeed in supplying what is a very real want theosophy is not only for the learned it is for all perhaps among those who in these little books catch their first glimpse of its teachings there may be a few who will be led by them to penetrate more deeply into its philosophy its science and its religion facing its abstruser problems with the student's zeal and the neophyte's ardour. But these manuals are not written for the eager student, whom no initial difficulties can daunt. They are written for the busy men and women of the workaday world, and seek to make plain some of the great truths that render life easier to bear and death easier to face. Written by servants of the masters, who are elder brothers of our race, they can have no other object than to serve our fellow men. The Astral Plane Introduction Reference to the Astral Plane, or Karma Loka as it is called in Sanskrit, has frequently been made by theosophical writers, and a good deal of information on the subject of this realm of nature is to be found scattered here and there in our books. But there is not, so far as I am aware, any single volume to which one can turn for a complete summary of the facts at present known to us about this interesting region. The object of this manual is to collect and make some attempt to arrange this scattered information and also to supplement it slightly in cases where new facts have come to our knowledge. It must be understood that any such additions are only the result of the investigations of a few explorers and must not therefore be taken as in any way authoritative but are given simply for what they are worth. On the other hand, every precaution in our power has been taken to ensure accuracy no fact, old or new, being admitted to this manual unless it has been confirmed by the testimony of at least two independent trained investigators among ourselves, and has also been passed as correct by older students whose knowledge on these points is necessarily more greater than ours. It is hoped, therefore, that this account of the astral plane, though it cannot be considered as quite complete, may yet be found reliable as far as it goes. The first point which it is necessary to make clear in describing this astral plane is its absolute reality. Of course, in using that word, I am not speaking from that metaphysical standpoint from which all but the one unmanifested is unreal because impermanent. I am using the word in its plain everyday sense, and I mean by it that the objects and inhabitants of the astral plane are real in exactly the same way as our own bodies, our furniture, our houses or monuments are real, as real as Charing Cross, to quote an expressive remark from one of the earliest theosophical works. They will no more endure for ever than will objects on the physical plane, but they are nevertheless realities from our point of view while they last, realities which we cannot afford to ignore merely because the majority of mankind is as yet unconscious or but vaguely conscious of their existence. There appears to be considerable misunderstanding even among theosophical students upon this question of the reality of the various planes of the universe. This may perhaps be partly due to the fact that the word plane has occasionally been very loosely used in our literature, writers speaking vaguely of the mental plane, the moral plane, and so on, and this vagueness has led many people to suppose that the information on the subject which is to be found in theosophical books is inexact and speculative, 
a mere hypothesis incapable of definite proof. No one can get a clear conception of the teachings of the wisdom religion until he has at any rate an intellectual grasp of the fact that in our solar system there exist perfectly definite planes, each with its own matter of different degrees of density, and that some of these planes can be visited and observed by persons who have qualified themselves for the work, exactly as a foreign country might be visited and observed, and that, by comparison of the observations of those who are constantly working on these planes, evidence can be obtained of their existence and nature at least as satisfactory as that which most of us have for the existence of greenland or spitzbergen the names usually given to these planes taking them in order of materiality rising from the denser to the finer are the physical the astral the devachanic the sushuptic and the nirvanic higher than this last are two others but they are so far above our present power of conception that for the moment they may be left out of consideration now it should be understood that the matter of each of these planes differs from that of the one below it in the same way as though to a much greater degree than vapour differs from solid matter in fact the states of matter which we call solid liquid and gaseous are merely the three lowest subdivisions of the matter belonging to this one physical plane the astral region which i am to attempt to describe is the second of these great planes of nature the next above or within that physical world with which we are all familiar it has often been called the realm of illusion not that it is itself any more illusory than the physical world but because of the extreme unreliability of the impressions brought back from it by the untrained seer this is to be accounted for mainly by two remarkable characteristics of the astral world first that many of its inhabitants have a marvellous power of changing their forms with protean rapidity and also of casting practically unlimited glamour over those with whom they choose to sport and secondly that sight on that plane is a faculty very different from and much more extended than physical vision an object is seen as it were from all sides at once the inside of a solid being as plainly open to the view as the outside it is therefore obvious that an inexperienced visitor to this new world may well find considerable difficulty in understanding what he really does see and still more in translating his vision into the very inadequate language of ordinary speech a good example of the sort of mistake that is likely to occur is the frequent reversal of any number which the seer has to read from the astral light so that he would be liable to render say one three nine as nine three one and so on in the case of a student of occultism trained by a capable master such a mistake would be impossible except through great hurry or carelessness since such a pupil has to go through a long and varied course of instruction in this art of seeing correctly the master or perhaps some more advanced pupil bringing before him again and again all possible forms of illusion and asking him what do you see any errors in his answers are then corrected and their reasons explained until by degrees the neophyte acquires a certainty and confidence in dealing with the phenomena of the astral plane which far exceeds anything possible in physical life but he has to learn not only to see correctly but to translate the memory of what he has seen accurately from one plane to the other and to assist him in this he is trained to carry his consciousness without break from the physical plane to the astral or devachanic and back again for until that can be done there is always a possibility that his recollections may be partially lost or distorted during the blank interval which separates his periods of consciousness on the various planes when the power of bringing over the consciousness is perfectly acquired the pupil will have the advantage of the use of all the astral faculties not only while out of his body during sleep or trance but also while fully awake in ordinary physical life it has been the custom of some theosophists to speak with scorn of the astral plane and treat it as entirely unworthy of attention but that seems to me a somewhat mistaken view most assuredly that at which we have to aim is the purely spiritual plane and it would be most disastrous for any student to neglect that higher development and rest satisfied with the attainment of astral consciousness 
there are some whose karma is such as to enable them to develop the purely spiritual faculties first of all to overleap the astral plane for the time as it were and when afterwards they make its acquaintance they have if their spiritual development has been perfect the immense advantage of dipping into it from above with the aid of a spiritual insight which cannot be deceived and a spiritual strength which nothing can resist it is however a mistake to suppose as some writers have done that this is the only or even the ordinary method adopted by the masters of wisdom with their pupils where it is possible it saves much trouble but for most of us such progress by leaps and bounds has been forbidden by our own faults or follies in the past all that we can hope for is to win our way slowly step by step and since this astral plane lies next to our world of denser matter it is usually in connection with it that our earliest superphysical experiences take place it is therefore by no means without interest to those of us who are but beginners in these studies and a clear comprehension of its mysteries may often be of the greatest importance to us not only by enabling us to understand many of the phenomena of the seance room of haunted houses etc which would otherwise be inexplicable but also to guard ourselves and others from possible dangers the first introduction to this remarkable region comes to people in various ways some only once in their whole lives under some unusual influence become sensitive enough to recognize the presence of one of its inhabitants and perhaps because the experience does not repeat itself come in time to believe that on that occasion they must have been the victims of hallucination others find themselves with increasing frequency seeing and hearing something to which those around them are blind and deaf others again and perhaps this is the commonest experience of all begin to recollect with greater and greater clearness that which they have seen or heard on that other plane during sleep among those who make a study of these subjects some try to develop the astral sight by crystal gazing or other methods while those who have the inestimable advantage of the direct guidance of a qualified teacher will probably be placed upon that plane for the first time under his special protection which will be continued until by the application of various tests he has satisfied himself that the pupil is proof against any danger or terror that he is likely to encounter but however it may occur the first actual realization that we are all the while in the midst of a great world full of active life of which most of us are nevertheless entirely unconscious cannot but be to some extent a memorable epoch in a man's existence so abundant and so manifold is this life of the astral plane that at first it is absolutely bewildering to the neophyte and even for the more practised investigator it is no easy task to attempt to classify and to catalogue it if the explorer of some unknown tropical forest were asked not only to give a full account of the country through which he had passed with accurate details of its vegetable and mineral productions but also to state the genus and species of every one of the myriad insects birds beasts and reptiles which he had seen he might well shrink appalled at the magnitude of the undertaking yet even this affords no parallel to the embarrassments of the psychic investigator for in his case matters are further complicated first by the difficulty of correctly translating from that plane to this the recollection of what he has seen and secondly by the utter inadequacy of ordinary language to express much of what he has to report however just as the explorer on the physical plane would probably commence his account of a country by some sort of general description of its scenery and characteristics so it will be well to begin this slight sketch of the astral plane by endeavouring to give some idea of the scenery which forms the background of its marvellous and ever-changing activities yet here at the outset an almost insuperable difficulty confronts us in the extreme complexity of the matter all who see fully on that plane agree that to attempt to call up before those whose eyes are as yet unopened a vivid picture of this astral scenery is like speaking to a blind man of the exquisite variety of tints in a sunset sky however detailed and elaborate the description may be there is no certainty that the idea presented before the hearer's mind will be an adequate representation of the truth 
End of part one.